Ladies, this one goes out to you. Just think, period cramps and breastpated tenderness could be a thing of the past with the information I'm about to share in this video. So without further ado, let's get into the nerdy, nerdy research of why this works and some of the mechanism, the, some of the story behind this. Then I will reveal what my ultimate number one top pick is and how to use it and some dietary strategies to fold in with the supplement strategy. So without further ado, let's put me in head bubble mode so I can show you a couple of research articles. And we'll play a little guessing game. We're going to see, can you guess what the thing is before I actually name the thing? Little little fun guessing game. It's the honor system because uh, obviously you could just watch the whole video and be like, I do it all along. All right. So this paper is titled Prostaglandin Receptor Signaling and Function in Human Endometrial Pathology. And if you follow my mouse to the third line, I'm going to just read a couple of sentences here. They say prostaglandins are key regulators of reproductive processes, including ovulation, implantation, and menstruation. Prostaglandins have been ascertained to have a role in various pathological changes of the reproductive tract, including menorrhagia, which is a very heavy or very prolonged bleed, dysmenorrhea, which is a painful or uncomfortable period, endometriosis, and cancer. Pretty cool stuff. Let's continue reading about these prostaglandins, shall we? All right. This paper, Prostaglandins and N3 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids in the Regulation of the Hypothalamic Pituitary Axis. Again, about partway, partway down the third line, I'm going to start reading. Prostaglandins are a component of this regulatory system, affecting multiple hormone synthesis and secretion pathways in the HP axis. The implications of these actions are that physiological processes or disease states that alter prostaglandin levels in the hypothalamus or pituitary can impinge on HP axis function. So for those of you who don't know this about hormones, the hypothalamic pituitary axis is like the master control system for your hormones. So if you want to secrete TSH so that you can then secrete thyroid hormone, that's the HP axis doing that. If you want to secrete follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone so that you can produce hormones and have ovulation and have a menstrual cycle in women, or if you want to secrete or produce testosterone or make sperm as a man, those things are regulated first and foremost by your HP axis. So if prostaglandins and N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are playing a big role in that system, this is hugely important, not only for sex hormones, but potentially for other hormones as well. It's pretty cool stuff, but let's keep reading. This is another paper, relatively recent. Inflammatory markers in dysmenorrhea and therapeutic options. So remember, dysmenorrhea is a painful or uncomfortable period. So really that's, you know, crampiness and PMS type symptoms. Uh, they say, let's see, da 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 all right, if you jump down to about the fourth line, prostaglandins play a major role in the pathomechanism of dysmenorrhea. In contrast, cytokines and other pro-inflammatory factors in primary dysmenorrhea are less studied. Now, if you open up this paper and read a little bit of the actual paper, they share a bit more of the mechanism. So let me move my head. And again, jumping down to about the fourth line, right about here is where I'm going to just read a teeny bit. PGF2-alpha mediates the constriction uh, constriction of arcuate vessels leading to local hypoxia in endometrial tissues. Hypoxia means a state of decreased oxygen. Generally speaking, none of your tissues like hypoxia. Uh, another task of PGF2-alpha is to stimulate smooth muscle to contract, which in turn supports menstrual bleeding. The action of PGE2 depends on the type of receptors, but it can include the relaxation of endometrial blood vessels and may work to increase swelling and recruit leukotrienes. In addition, prostaglandins may be involved in the formation of other chemokines and growth factors involved in the inflammatory response or in the repair process after menstruation. Prostaglandins may also increase the migration of neutrophils and leukocytes into the endometrium. Those are both types of white blood cells. So, these prostaglandins, whether you have inflammatory prostaglandins or anti-inflammatory prostaglandins swimming around in your body, this is going to really affect your hormone levels, your hormone cycle, 
and perceived pain and things like inflammation and swelling and oxygen delivery to those tissues. Now I'm going to move my head up a little bit here. They do mention, I'm not going to read all of this because it's a little lengthy, but they mention a couple of studies, some of them going a little bit far back down to 1978, where they took women with dysmenorrhea, with painful periods, and they compared the prostaglandin levels to that of a control group, a healthy control group, women who did not have painful periods. And they did find that the women who had painful periods had higher levels of inflammatory prostaglandins compared to the healthy, normal control women. So we're, we're definitely building this hypothesis. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm pointing out four research articles out of like a gajillion. There's so much reading you could do on this, or you could just take my word for it and listen to what I recommend at the end of the video. The choice is yours, but there is more reading should you choose to go that direction. Now, here's another article. This one's pretty recent too, 2021. And this one is titled, The Influence of Ma Macronutrient Intake, Stress, and Prostaglandin Levels of Urine with the Incidence of Dysmenorrhea in Adolescents. So what they did was they compared 64 teenagers who had dysmenorrhea or painful periods and 64 teenagers who did not experience painful periods. And when they looked at the data, the two things that were correlated with dysmenorrhea, if you could jump down here to the results, the two things that were related, stress and prostaglandins. So now that we know this, now that we know that there is an abundance of evidence supporting the role of prostaglandins in dysmenorrhea and other uterine and female hormonal states, the question is, how do we modify the prostaglandins? What do we do about it? It's all cool to talk about prostaglandins, but what the heck do we do? Well, that's where my favorite supplement comes in, for this task at least, and that is fish oil. Now, I know you could get the omega-3 fatty acids from things like krill, algae, or perhaps even flax seeds, but not everybody or not everybody's body is especially well skilled at converting the oils in flax into the so-called fish oils EPA and DHA. So personally, clinically, what I like to do is I like to just jump to the end of that sequence and I like to just dose fish oil. So that's what I personally do. If you want to take a stab at some of the other things like krill and algae and flax, you could certainly try that. I just don't think that they're going to be as much of a slam dunk as just jumping into the fish oil. But what I personally do with my patients I get one of these Nordic Naturals products. They have a million different products. They're all good. It's a good, reputable company. It's a bit more expensive than most, but honestly, most fish oil is garbage and it's rancid on the shelf before you even get it to your house. So I would just cough up the extra do re me for the Nordic Natural stuff, get the good stuff. What you want to do is get something that's really concentrated. So you want to get either a liquid that's really potent or you want to get these capsules. So like this one is the Pro Omega 2000. I'm sure that they have another product that is similar if you want something else, but I get the highest dose stuff that you can get because you're going to be taking the stuff until it squirts out your ears, metaphorically speaking. So the key I find with fish oil, and this is for inflammatory states, pain states, and dysmenorrhea, all three of them, I find that people either are taking a fish oil product that is absolute garbage and it's rancid and it's not therapeutic anymore, or they're not taking enough of it. We have to get this in your system and essentially saturate your tissues with the stuff in order to have the effect that we want. So what I usually do, if I have a female patient who has painful period cramps or a lot of breast pain and tenderness, a lot of these symptoms, what I'll usually have her do, and I'll kind of mentally prepare her for this, is I say, all right, you're going to be taking a truckload of this stuff for like a month or two. And it's going to feel like a lot of pills. It's going to feel really stupid. It's going to be expensive. But we're going to get you to the other side of it to where you can maintain the effect without taking a million pills. But you want to shoot for probably between 6,000 and 8,000 milligrams of combined EPA and DHA per day. And you want to maintain that stupidly high dose of the stuff for at least a month or two. Usually what I find is that if you do it for about a month, your next period is notably better. And if you continue it for one more month after that, your period is like damn near miraculously normal. 
then you could start to whittle your way down. So if you started out at eight grams, 8,000 milligrams of combined EPA and DHA, if you start out that high for the first two months, then if you do start to feel a benefit, you could start to back down and maybe you go down from eight to six and you do that for a month, then you're still feeling good or you're feeling even better. Then you could back down to four and then two. And then ultimately, I like to have most people who are taking fish oil take a maintenance dose of about one gram a day or 1,000 milligrams combined EPA and DHA. So one of the reasons why I like this is, A, it's a good quality product, but also it ends up being that one capsule is one gram of EPA and DHA. So it's just super easy to dose. If you're taking eight grams of fish oil, it ends up being eight of these capsules, and you could spread them out throughout the day. If you're taking six, it ends up being six capsules. It's just really simple math. It's really easy and and you know intuitive to figure out. Again, you could do a liquid. I would stick with a really reputable brand. One thing about fish oil is if you open up the bottle and it smells like rotten old fish, it is rotten old fish, and you should throw it away. The Nordic Naturals products virtually never smell, even if if they've been open for a month or two. They are very, very stable. So that's partially why I like them. Hashtag not sponsored. I don't earn any money from Nordic Naturals. So that's not what this is about. I just think that they make good products. Um, I'm going to share just now now for, for the end of the video, I want to share also that you can probably achieve some degree of benefit from this with modifying the fat intake in your diet. So limiting the unhealthy fats, the, um, you know, the trans fats and the, the processed fats and the, the seed oils, like the canola oil, limiting those oils and really beefing up your healthy fat intake. So things like olive oil, avocado, certainly fish, particularly if you could get wild caught or really good quality seafood and eat that once or twice a week. Um, I think that grass fed beef and grass fed and pasture raised Meat is also a a pretty good source, although I don't think it's a replacement for seafood. Um, And then certainly nuts and seeds, particularly if they're fresher and they haven't gone rancid. Uh, Nuts and seeds do go rancid after a while. So I like to store a lot of mine in the freezer if it's not something that I use super frequently. So I've got a big old bag of almonds, a big old bag of walnuts, and a thing of flax seeds and a thing of chia seeds. They all live in my freezer and I just pull them out when I need them versus the nuts that I like to munch on. And I actually snack on a bit. So like cashews or a mixed nut kind of combo, I do leave that on the shelf because I go through it quickly enough that I don't have to worry about it going rancid typically. Uh, But keep that in mind with nuts and seeds. Whether or not you could do this on a vegan or vegetarian diet, I think is up for you to prove or disprove. Again, personally, I'm a really big fan of just jumping right to fish oil and being done with it and not dosy doing around with the plant-based options because not everybody converts the oil in flaxseed into the so-called fish oils very efficiently. And even, even the people who do make the conversion, it's not a super efficient conversion in humans to begin with. So I think more of an omnivorous approach and eating a little bit of everything and doing the fish oil from actual fish sources is a better route. But to each their own, if you want to experiment with it and do more of a plant-based model of this, you could certainly try that. And I think if you're just eating healthy in general, you're going to be lowering your intake of inflammatory fats and boosting your good fats typically anyhow. So that's going to go a really long way. But yeah, month or two, super high dose fish oil, and then titrate down within a couple of months. I think that the symptom will be a thing of the past for you. Now I'm going to share something too, to just build on this. This is maybe a little bit less relevant to all of you, but I will share. Interestingly enough, I think I proved this hypothesis with my own body as well. So I usually am blessed with really easy periods. They're not particularly heavy. They're not particularly drawn out. I almost never get cramps. The only thing that I sometimes get is maybe like once or twice a year, I will get a very dull one out of 10 headache the day before. But I also get those headaches if I'm dehydrated. So maybe it's less to do with with my period. But anyhow, I have very easy periods. A couple of years ago, I very badly sprained my ankle. I wiped out going down some stairs. I thought that there was a, I thought that I was on flat ground and I was not yet. So I wiped out and I sprained my ankle really pretty severely. And I was nursing it back to health and I was elevating it and lasering it and I was really babying it, but it was very puffy, very swollen, very inflamed and angry. And my body was dealing with that inflammatory state, right? I didn't think the rest of me was really affected. 
but my ankle sure as heck was angry and puffy and swollen and inflamed. Well, about two weeks after I sprained that ankle, I got my period and it was the period from HE double hockey sticks. It was wildly different from what I normally would get to a point where the cramps were so bad. I was finding myself holding my breath for each of the cramps. And I told my husband, I was like, this is so weird for me. It's almost like I'm in labor again. This is terrible. And then it occurred to me, oh, because my body is dealing with a lot of inflammation right now. And I thought about it and I realized I had kind of slacked off on my fish oil for a couple of months. Usually, you know, I try to take one of these, you know, at least a couple times a week, if not daily. And sure enough, the combination of an injury that my body was trying to process and clean up for me, and the fact that I had slacked off on my fish oil a bit, I think that those two things contributed. And I had the worst period of my entire life. So right away, I figured out what happened, thankfully. And I immediately started on my fish oil. And I didn't have to go super crazy because I, I, I didn't, hadn't fallen off the wagon that severely, in my opinion. So I think I might've started at like four or five grams a day. And I did that for the month. And then by the time my next period rolled around, it was a non-issue. I had my normal, boring, old, asymptomatic period. And it was wonderful again. So I, you know, I, I for better or worse, I use my body as a guinea pig for a lot of y'all. Um, or I just report on it more than the average person does. But I think that that helped to prove this hypothesis but more importantly, I have had so many female patients and students in FODMAP Freedom, my group coaching program, who have used this and they've reported wonderful success that their breast painted tenderness that comes with their period and their cramping is so much better that it's just borderline miraculously different. So I would be curious if the same is true for you. If you try this and it works for you, please come back and leave a YouTube comment so that other people can read the comments and get some hope. You know that we all do that, right? Like if you look at something on Amazon, you immediately go to the reviews. If you find a new hack or a new tip on YouTube, you immediately go to the comments to see if anybody commented to see if it actually works or if I'm full of horseradish. So if you try this and if it works for you, please leave a comment down below. I would love to hear your success stories with this. Again, I've used this clinically for a number of years and I've used it on myself in that one instance and it works marvelously. I'm going to knock on wood here. I don't think I've had a single case of period cramps and breast pain and tenderness that I have yet to lick with this single strategy. So hopefully I can keep up that 100% uh, statistic here. A little risky putting this on YouTube because maybe you guys are going to crash and burn my statistics, but this is really, really effective and I hope it helps you. And I hope that you have the most boring period of your life the next time you bleed. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.